Hi. Uh, Dr. Armstrong uh, is the director of the uh, neuropsychology laboratory as part of the neuro-oncology program. But uh, as we shift from the area of specific treatments to the effect of treatments, I'd like to point out that Dr. Armstrong represents uh, a, um, if not unique, at least a extraordinarily specialized uh, and uh, important resource for us and for you. That is, somebody whose, exper whose expertise is in neurocognitive assessment, but also uh, the effects of radiation therapy, um, a, f uh, a high level of focus on structural abnormalities in the brain as they, re as they result in or have imp implications for thinking and learning. And thirdly, a particular interest in the uh, effects on <coughs> of these treatments on working memory. So these are all quite relevant to us as opposed to many um, outside the hospital neurocognitive assessing people uh, who are working primarily with kids who have maybe learning disorders, but no structural abnormalities. So Dr. Armstrong has a sp uh, specific and a, I think, unique uh, role and uh, group of uh, information uh, sets to bring to this discussion. Thanks. So um, the conference uh, decided to focus this talk on kind of how to arm you as family members in the use of neuropsych uh, assessment. And so that's how I oriented this talk. Uh, first, just a little bit, I want to point out that there is a great um, deal of information being gathered about brain tumors and central nervous system tumors. In 1992, the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the United States was funded uh, initially by the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation, and now it collects information on all malignant and non-malignant tumors. And you can look at it state by state, and when you do, you see that Pennsylvania has one of the highest rates of malignant tumors, but it also has one of the lowest mortality rates. And in fact, um, rates of survival have increased quite a bit over the years. Cancer is increasing in the population. When I first started in this, being funded in research in this field, the NIH was saying that 33% of Americans would get some form of cancer. Now it's 50% of Americans will get some form of cancer in their lifetime. But as you can see, the rates of survival are increasing. And I'm sorry, and if you look at approximately the last 10 years, I don't see in pediatrics, I don't see any increase really in the rates of brain tumor over that time. But our goal is not only survival, but survival with a good quality of life. Um, and the cognitive effects of both the tumor and the treatments are one of the most disabling impairments to quality of life. And your doctor, as you heard today, is very concerned about that and includes it in their decision making about which way to go, what to discuss with you. So first I want to say, how is a neuropsych evaluation different from a school evaluation sometimes called a psychoed? So, sorry about that. So um, look over here first. The school eval basically gives you IQ, achievement testing, and sometimes some other educational performances in greater detail. And what they're concerned about, they have their own metric of what to, how to, uh, what programs to provide your child. And, one of the main things they're interested in is, is there a discrepancy between IQ and achievement? That is, is I, if IQ is not, uh, is considered in the inter, um, intellectually disabled range, that qualifies them for a whole set of programs. But they're looking for a discrepancy, um, a statistical discrepancy, uh, between an IQ that's somewhere in the average range and achievement scores that are lower. And that's their definition of learning disability, and that's their prior definition of how to get someone an IEP and how to provide them those services. And obviously our children break all these rules. There's nothing typical about a child with a brain tumor and their cognitive problems. And that's why we do these neuropsych evaluations. So these functions here, sensory perception and motor control, attention, information processing speed, various aspects of language and verbal memory processes, what do you do with your perception and mental rotation of objects, Visual spatial memory, reasoning and control functions, including social perception and social cognition, as we're able to test that today, um, and IQ may or may not be involved. Um, this, these are intended to give a fine-grained view of what's going on here. 
And by, there, there are finer ways, finer grained ways still of looking at cognition, but this is much more finely grained than this is. And um, it's by using a finer grained approach to cognition that you learn more. So what is neuropsychology? Well, it's the study of brain uh, behavior. Okay, so cognitive and other behavioral functions that are associated with brain regions. It began in World War II when we were able to know, initially in World War I, but it really took off and formalized tests were developed after in World War II when you could see where the, where the damage was in the brain and they began to create formal tests of, to measure it. And those, that's when the theories really evolved, um, although uh, other aspects of it go back hundreds of years. But, um, I, I, if you look, how does it fit into the treatment plan? Look at the fine print. Your physician often is required to write a letter of medical necessity. It's not always automatically given. Some extra effort is involved in getting your child that, that service. So why should you have neuropsych evaluations? Well, it's to identify the effects of the brain tumor first. Also, other cancer-related disorders may be involved or neurofibromatosis may be involved. Um, then there are the cancer treatments that you've been learning about a lot today and their effects on cognition, behavior, learning, and social emotional function. So we're trying to include a pretty holistic view of the child. Um, when do these evaluations occur? This is very variable too. So one, two, it can be used to monitor treatment effects. And if you're going to do that, you really need a pre-treatment baseline. Um, you can establish a baseline at any time for future comparison, but there's certain important things that occur after. So after surgery, there's really two years of cognitive improvement that, that occurs, so that will cause a change or you know, it'll, it'll, uh, interact with the other patterns you're looking at. Um, in other words, the child hasn't reached baseline yet. Or after radiation, there are different phases of cognitive change and certain processes that occur over time. So there's a bit involved in when it occurs, but in general, um, uh, it's best to start it before the treatment, but you can establish a baseline for future comparison at any time. Um, also, neurological changes in the brain caused by the tumor and treatments can be delayed, and behavior problems can emerge late. Um, there are encephalomalacia sometimes on sets within a year after surgery, and that's, um, Nothing, I don't think we saw any pictures of it today, but uh, it's unpredictable, and we don't know who it's going to occur in, but it can often cause a change in cognition. New, new symptoms come up that you may need the evaluation for. Um, when, another good time is when your child is medically stable and ready for return to greater activity, and that's a good time to get a baseline for future comparison. And also to identify or change modifications in school needed to support their learning. So there are many different reasons for doing it. Um, also when a child reaches a new uh, developmental level is another time perhaps. So what should you, this is one of the most important slides actually I want to show you today. What should you make sure you gain from a neuropsychological evaluation? Well one, remember it's not therapy. You're not going to get therapy from it. A neuropsychologist is not typically a therapist. In some practice models, in some hospitals, they will do both. At CHOP, we are fortunate to have specialists in the more uh, psychosocial aspects uh, involved in oncology and psychologists for that, and then we have neuropsychologists. Um, we're not totally divorced from each other, but it is good to have people who can look in, in detail at these aspects. Then another thing is you should get the sense that you've got in a detailed analysis of, a, of the uh, child's neurologically caused functional impairments, even if we don't know what the exact causes are. The tests are designed to separate the psychological problems or the psychological causes from the neurological causes. So, you, you, you know, the things that are changeable and within the child's control versus the things that are not within the child's control. Um, but you should also get your recommendations. So the detailed analysis is the best way to get specific recommendations for uh, rehabilitative or educational treatments. And uh, this, I really want to, you should understand the findings, okay? You, if you have an evaluation, make sure that you've discussed it so that you understand it. You must have a discussion about the results so that you're the point person for that knowledge from that point out. 
So it's important that you understand it. Um, <clears throat> a neuropsychological evaluation is also necessary in order to begin cognitive rehabilitation or for school accommodations, it's required. And um, if your child is struggling, it's strongly recommended if, you're, if they're gonna have an individualized education plan. A lot of people have those plans without the evaluation yet. Sometimes it's just a timing issue, but if you're going to have an IEP, you should have that um, evaluation. That is not just the school evaluation, the neuropsychological evaluation. So reviewing, this is a bit of a review. What has caused my child to struggle with learning and behavior after undergoing treatments? Well, first of all, let's see, it's the presence of the tumor. That impacts behavior and learning in unpredictable ways because the tumor invades or destroys or just impinges on some of the brain it is displacing. The location of the tumor can have a very strong effect on a critical ability. So you can have a small tumor in a critical cortical region and have a very kind of dis distinct, discrete effects that affect though every behavior related to that ability, such as uh, phonological awareness, understanding the sounds of language that they're hearing, a certain tumor can cause that and affect everything that they do having to do with language, or even face understanding can be caused. These are some of the patients we've seen. Um, and that can affect any kind of memory or perception or social skill related to that ability. Or you can have a tumor that affects many abilities in a, in a more subtle way. Surgery often causes injury and it sometimes causes improvement. Um, and the reason is there's usually functional brain tissue that's embedded within the tumor. Um, it's the way tumors, beha tumors behave, it's why everything is so unpredictable from the brain tumor. Radiation damage, as you've heard, destroys the tumor cells as they divide, but it also damages other parts of the brain in the path of the radiation, especially those areas, those, those, that brain tissue and structures that have stem cells that um, divide to replace blood vessels, remyelinate neurons, build new neurons. We're learning more and more about this, but these cells are very, very, stem cells are very, very sensitive. What we're learning more about is not only that they're responsible probably for a lot of the cognitive changes, but also that they're, we're learning that there are more and more brain structures in the postnatal person, so a child or adult, that have stem cells. So this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Um, chemotherapy affects cognition mood, neuroendocrine levels, causes fatigue. Um, and among children, of course, the youngest are most vulnerable to side effects of radiation. And um, then there are other individual factors that add risk, like a pre-existing genetic disorder or multiple sclerosis or some other disease that uh, causes risk to the white matter. And these will affect the decision whether to radiate or not. So, what is your parental philosophy? And I'm gonna just skip down to the last paragraph here. I always, I try to discuss this with parents or listen for it and bring it out during a discussion because are you going to focus on the strengths or are you gonna focus on the weaknesses or somehow, and if you focus on both, how are you going to do that? So what I wanna remind you is that the strengths are what predict your child's eventual attainment and personal satisfaction in life. And this is another aspect that we don't think about much. After, so during the first six or 12 months after a neurological injury um, is when the kind of spontaneous neural recovery occurs, when the remaining neurons are stimulated to grow new tree branch endings and start communicating with um, other cells other neurons, but after that 12 to 6 to 12 month period, what you're really rehabilitating are the strengths, the more intact brain reaches, whether it's pharmaceutical treatment or behavioral treatment, you know, therapies, physical and occupational and cognitive therapies, you're really strengthening what the child can do and using that to support what the child's weaknesses are. So, for example, a child whose intellectual kind of reasoning uh, abilities have not been affected by all of this. They have an advantage, uh, one of the advantages that they have, I should say, in um, dealing with maybe a severe memory impairment or some other cognitive impairment because they're more likely to spontaneously develop compensating strategies. Um, so uh, it's important to 
remember that uh, we're not just trying to make the child come back. We're not just trying to help them recover. Sometimes they can't. Sometimes you can't undo what's been done. So if you turn it around a bit and realize that what you really want to do is support what your child can do, it, it gives you a different framework and parental philosophy about how to approach the problems and struggles as they come along. So um, this is a slide to encourage you as parents, I suspect since you all are here, you're the ones who are doing this anyway, but um, to be involved with either the 504, the Individualized Education Plan, so the 504 is not for uh, support of special learning needs, but to help your child keep up in school because of her medical condition or disability. The IEP, the Individualized Education Plan, is for special learning needs and possibly multiple disabilities, and it's highly individualized to your child's needs. You must learn your rights and responsibilities. You must put your, your time and education into this so that you can be the most effective participant in IEP meetings at school. Don't do it alone. Bring people with you. Bring all the people you want. Bring all the specialists. Bring all the family members. Bring whoever you want with you to the IEP meetings. It will help give you confidence and help you focus on what you need to get accomplished. Each school district and each school has different resources and attitudes and different experiences and abilities to consider your child's needs. Here are, I can give these to you later, but here are some, um, some of the uh, most important, um, uh, I, you know, helpful, I think, um, apps and um, centers to get help from, and we can discuss that later. Um, and then I want to say, should the evaluation be repeated? Sometimes, remember this, a neuropsych eval is part of the research study, and the study determines the timing of follow-up visits. But an exam should be repeated if your child's capacities are changing, if there are new neurological problems, if your child has reached a more demanding developmental level, like when they learn to read or enter middle school or high school or college. And remember this, colleges require a cognitive evaluation that is dated within two years of the request for learning support services. So, this is the last slide, just to point out the effects of tumor and behavior are on cognition, which is about adapting to the environment. So you're using your finer, finer grained aspects of cognition. Those are the ones that give you a view into how someone is adapting to the environment in order to learn. Emotion, there's their acceptance of their own uniqueness. Um, there, of course, their physical self, their social life, um, there are all these risks of isolation and failure to develop relationships with others, and then these drive-related abilities as well. So thank you very much.